<coughs> Good morning and welcome to Anderson Hills. We're glad you're here to worship with us. Please stand as we sing our first hymn together. You may be seated. Will you join with me as we pray, pray the prayer of confession and pardon? Almighty and most merciful God, you know the thoughts of our hearts. We confess that we have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. We have transgressed your holy laws. We have disregarded your word and sacraments. Forgive us, O Lord. Give us grace and power to put away all hurtful things, that being delivered from bondage of sin, we may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, and from henceforth may ever walk in your holy ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant us remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. 
Jesus, we thank you this Lenten season as we journey with you to the cross, where you made a way for us through the wilderness of sin, a way to eternal life. On whatever bewildering paths we find ourselves this morning, give us grace to look to you, the way, the truth, and the life, to lead us home to your forgiving, loving, healing arms. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the baptisms of William and Carson today. To sign the presence of your spirit and grace with water to them. And to surround them with your love made visible through us, their church family. We ask your help to keep the covenant we make with them and with you. We rejoice with Taylor, Justin, Hannah, and Hannah as they are confirmed today expressing their faith in you and joining us to represent your love and way to the world. Together, we look forward to growing in your word and love, serving in your kingdom, rejoicing in the community of faith, and knowing the intimacy and power of prayer and worship. We pray for our church family this week as we represent your love in Jamaica Walk in your steps in the Holy Land. Feed the hungry in our community. Grow in your word. And share the joy of those who take another step in their journey of faith through Stephen ministry, baptism, or confirmation. May the power and fruits of your spirit be evident in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome. Thanks for being here to share the joy of those who are being baptized and confirmed today. Your presence and support is very important. And isn't it exciting to be a part of a church that's growing in faith and numbers? And a special welcome to our our guest. We're so glad you're here and are here to worship with us and to share in this exciting day. To help us get to know you better, if you would. If you would fill out the Connect card that's in the pew rack in front of you, and you can turn it in here to one of our ushers, or you can take it to the Welcome Center, where you'll receive a personal welcome and a gift card to Orange Leaf Yogurt. If you have a prayer concern or a joy that you would like uh, our prayer teams to include in their prayers this week, uh, please write it down on the Pray card, again located in the pew rack in front of you, and place it in the offering plate. And please print your name and address on the attendance pads as they are passed. And then return the pads to the side aisles so the ushers can pick them up during the offertory. And uh, you can look around and you can even see some little ones. Some special little ones in their, in their uh, beautiful dress today. And greet them uh, as we leave the service today. <clears throat> you can invite someone to church next week and it's easy. Just uh, grab one of these postcards and uh, invite a friend to join you as we enjoy a Cincinnati Reds theme. You're encouraged to wear your Reds gear, meet Mr. Redlegs, and if you meet the age limit, I see some here who do, uh, try out our batting cage. Next Sunday, uh, students from Otterbein University will present a special concert with music and dance uh, next Sunday evening. The concert concert will be here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. And it will cost $5 at the door uh, to support, uh, to help support the, uh, and cover the choir's travel expenses. And don't forget to grab a box or two for Project 5000 as you head out today. Local pantries report that the number, number of families in need of food continue to grow. Would you please stand? The peace of the Lord be with you. Please greet each other.
May the ushers come forward that we may receive our tithes and gifts. As we journey through our time of Lent together, we offer you the opportunity to understand that there is truly room at the cross for you. We would also like to invite you to join us in the third singing of the chorus of our morning song. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain, as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from those sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The first reading today comes from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, page 890 in your pew Bible. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. 
He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. May we stand for our hymn. Preach my gospel to every creature. 
preach my gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world, go ye into all the world and preach my gospel. Go ye into all the world, go ye into all the world and preach Good morning, church. Today we um, are Essential 100. We are moving to the New Testament. Uh, How many of you have uh, been able to keep up on your daily reading so far? Oh, a number of you. Congratulations. That's terrific. Well, today we are looking at the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 3. If you want to open up your Bibles and follow along, I'm going to be getting in verse 2. Let us hear God's Word. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to him to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Well, as the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, his winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is God's Word. Well, in Luke chapter 3, we are introduced to John the Baptist. Uh, He lives in the wilderness. He wears camel hair suits, and he is eating locusts and wild honey. And he is preaching this fiery message of repentance that calls people to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Now, unlike Isaiah or Jeremiah, he leaves behind no body of literature. Uh, No book of the Bible is written by him. In fact, all the words recorded from his lips would hardly constitute half of a page. And yet his role is so significant that Jesus says of him, Among these born of women, no one has risen greater than John. Now I'm sure that Jesus was the only one who thought so. King Herod uh, surely thought as ruler of Galilee that he would receive a much more prominent place in the pages of history than John. But the only reason we remember Herod today is because he is the one who beheaded John. Even Tiberius Caesar is known to us because of his association with the beginnings of Christianity. I mean, isn't it interesting how history can change things in importance? Uh, Tiberius, ruler of the Roman Empire, must have thought that he would go down in history as the most important person of his time, rather than a half-naked prophet in an obscure, backwater nation of Judah. So why were people coming to John? 
What was it about him that was so attractive? I mean, you think that people would stay away from him. I mean, if he were to show up today in Anderson Township, would you invite him uh, to your club? Or would you introduce him to your social circle? I mean, first of all, John is in the wilderness of the Jordan. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, it was a good place to get away from a hostile society. You see, the Roman and Jewish authorities are not going to bother him down there. Of course, fugitives often flee into the wilderness to get away, to escape. That's where the prophet Elijah fled when pursued by Queen Jezebel. And Jesus, of course, was tempted there in the wilderness. And Israel wandered in the wilderness there for some 40 years. But it can also be a place of spiritual renewal. But most importantly, that's where Isaiah said that it would all begin. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So not only is John in the middle of nowhere, but he's dressed in camel skins. And he's eating this simple diet of locusts seasoned with honey. Now what's interesting is that the ancient biographers never describe the appearance of people unless there is a specific reason. You see, we know more about John's appearance than, than we know uh, about Jesus. And so Luke is telling us about John's lifestyle to let us know this, that he was a radical servant of God who was challenging the values of his culture that had lost touch with God. And so John is not interested in, in the trappings of success. He is not even interested in the comforts of life. And I think, too, that, that Luke and the other gospel writers are letting us know that this is a fulfillment of, of Malachi's, Malachi's prophecy. That God would send the, the prophet Elijah before that great and terrible day of the Lord comes. John seems to be obsessed with truth, doesn't he? I mean, he is as real as it gets. There's nothing fake about him. Uh, in his crazy get-up far away from the halls of power and influence, he is declaring this advent of, of a new day, that something brand new that God is doing. And his goal was not about personal position or advancement. He was not a name to be, to be reckoned with, but he was a voice to be heard. And John's not preparing a kingdom for himself, but he is preparing the way for somebody else who is coming, the Christ. So that when Christ comes upon the scene, uh, John gracefully slips off of the center stage. In fact, some of John's friends said to him, Look, John, the crowds are leaving you and, and they're flocking to Jesus. And so John quickly reminds them that he had said all along that he was not the Messiah, but that he was pointing the one who was coming. You know, I think a, a less committed person could not have made such a, a graceful exit. I mean, praise and public recognition are intoxicating, aren't they? They make drunken fools of the most solid and, and reasoned of politicians and Hollywood stars in our day. How many begin to believe in their own greatness and then we get tripped up by our own self-importance. Self-promoters come and go, but they make no lasting impressions on human lives. Wasn't it the late Andy Warhol who, who said that we live in a time when everybody will be a celebrity for at least 15 minutes? John survived. Because he was not a self-promoter. His lifestyle clearly announced a different set of values from his culture. And then there's John's message. I mean, it's simple and it's real too. He's proclaiming this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. And it has a, a two-fold meaning. First of all, it means to turn away from our sins. And then secondly, it means to turn towards God. It's a turning away from sin in the old way of life. And it's a turning towards God. It's about a life changed. And it's being washed in, in the waters of the Jordan. And that's symbolizing this life change. Now, why is repentance so necessary? It's because we're sinners. <laughs> We're not just people who need a little bit of self-improvement. We're not just people who need help being a better person. We are, we are sinners who need to change our ways. Because it's so easy for us to get comfortable with, with what we know to be wrong. Have you ever found yourself getting comfortable with, with sin and compromise? 
It's tempting, isn't it? We begin to accept our addictions, our stagnant marriages. We begin to accept our our cynical attitudes and, and our secret behaviors. But John sees it exactly as it is. And and John's favorite phrase is, you brood of vipers. And while Luke's gospel records John calling everyone a viper, Matthew's gospel says that he reserved it for the religious leaders of his time, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, but bear fruits worthy of your repentance? In other words, if you've really undergone a life change, let's see some fruit. Let's see the results of it. That's the only proof that you're the real thing. And then John goes on. He says, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these rocks that you see. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' time were were betting on their genealogy to get them into heaven. You see, among the first century Jewish people, it was generally believed they were saved by virtue of the fact that they were descended from Abraham. And so if you were a son or a daughter of Abraham, you were in, and and if you were not, then you were out. Some of us today still have that misunderstanding. We think that if we have relatives who are Christians, then we're going to get in too. I've heard people say, you know, my my parents were Baptists, and so I'm going to heaven. I've had many times... Many people tell me, you know, my great-grandfather was a Methodist preacher, and so I'm getting in too. Or our family is is a pillar of the church back home, but God has no grandchildren. God only has sons and daughters. Sometimes we think we're going to get in because of all of our religious activity. I go to church. I teach Sunday school. I, I say grace before dinner. But Jesus reminds us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, it was the Pharisees who were the masters of religious activity in their day, obeying every rule and and every regulation of the Torah, reading the Hebrew Bible, attending synagogue, and, and looking down on everyone who didn't follow their example. But they weren't doing the will of God, and it was this group who received the greatest criticism from both John and Jesus. You see, we think that if we engage in a lot of religious activity, that God will somehow love us more. And so we do all these religious things, but we're never doing the will of God. Well, sometimes we think that we're going to get in because we're not as, as bad as our neighbors. Sure, I, I, I may have done a few bad things, but at least I'm not as, as bad as my next door neighbor. You should meet him. Or her. Or at least I'm not as bad as the person sitting beside me in the pew this morning. Thank God for that. But Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember the story. And both of them are standing in the temple and they're both praying. And and, and the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people. Thieves and rogues and adulterers or even like this tax collector. God, I I, I fast twice a week and, and I give a tenth of all my income Aren't I something, God? But all the tax collector could do was to stand there with his head bowed and beat his chest and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, God doesn't grade on the curve. So what John is reminding us is that there needs to be change in our lives, that we need to bear fruit. John says, don't take the easy way. Don't go through the wide gate Uh, The way the crowd goes, you don't have to think much. You can can do that in your spare time. You can dabble in it. You can give it an an hour a week and be done with it. It doesn't require much attention. It doesn't require much focus. I love what verse 2 says in our scripture. It says, the word of God came to John. I mean, read back through the Old Testament, through through Isaiah and and Jonah and, and Jeremiah. All of them had the experience of the Word of God coming to them that that marked the beginning of their calling. You see, when the Word of God comes to you, you you have to respond. You have to say, yes, Lord. You see, because John had a calling from God, it, it became his number one priority in life. Nothing else mattered to John except doing the will of God. Nothing else mattered. And so his whole attitude was, I don't give a hoot what happens to me as long as I fulfill the purpose that God has laid out for my life. And he knew what God wanted him to do. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he knew. Now, I think that's the secret of the Christian life. See, John had no need to get credit for all of his accomplishments. 
was all about God. Now, I'm sure that John had a, a strong ego. I mean, he could hardly have lived such a, a radical kind of lifestyle. He could hardly have preached a message of repentance to kings and, and face imprisonment without a strong ego. But he had such a high commitment to the purposes of God that he could submerge his powerful temperament into his mission. And in so doing, he literally loses his head to King Herod. But he also changes history. And we will too when we discover our purpose, our God-given purpose. I'd like for us this morning to do some reflection. What will I do with the life that God has given me? What will I do with the time, with the days, with the hours that I have left? You see, the truth is, is that God is looking for people who, like John the Baptist, want to make a difference in their world. And I think the best way for us to do that is to, is to live it every day. Jesus said, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your, to your Father in heaven. I heard a preacher the other day put it this way. He says, do you have the stink of Jesus on you? In other words, is it obvious that without having to say anything that, that people know that you have been with Jesus and that you're living in his presence each and every day? You see, people are watching the way that we live. Your friends, your neighbors, your, your relatives, your classmates, they are watching your words and your actions, and they are, are observing how you treat other people. See, the bottom line is love. So when John is asked by the crowd what they should do, John says, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must share with those who are hungry. That's the fruit of a changed life that John is looking for. But not only do we need to, to live our faith, we also need to share it. Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, he says, Make the most of your chances to tell others about the good news. So we need to not only walk the talk, but we need to talk the walk. Now that scares some of us. We think, I don't know enough to talk about Jesus, baloney. I think the most compelling method of faith sharing is to simply share with people what God has done in your life. Last night at our confirmation dinner, all 20 of our confirmants got up and for about five minutes just shared about what their life was like before Christ and, and how it's different now. So inspiring, so exciting to hear what, what God is doing in the life of these confirmants. It's the same way in my life. I share with people how, what life was like before Christ and how through that I found reason for living. See, it's just about being real people with real hearts and real motives and real goals. People who are committed to a real lifestyle, to a real message, to a real calling. It doesn't have to be profound. It doesn't have to have an incredible significance. But you can make an eternal difference in the lives of your family, your friends, your neighbors, and your classmates. You don't have to be dressed like John. You don't have to eat locusts and wild honey. We just need to commit ourselves to God's purposes for our lives, to let him have his way, to surrender our wills to his, and to faithfully allow him to work in us and through us. You can make a difference difference exactly where God has put you now, today. Well, today is Confirmation Sunday. Now, some of you who come from a different faith background or maybe no faith background at all may be wondering, what in the world is Confirmation? Well, United Methodists practice infant baptism. We're going to do that in just a few moments. And since babies can't make a profession of faith for themselves, the parents do it for them. That's what the, the Lack and the Rothfuss families are doing this morning. They're going to promise to raise their children, uh, William and Carson, in the faith and, and to teach them the scriptures. But as I said earlier, God has no grandchildren. You can't get to heaven because of your parents. And so there comes a point in time when, when Liam and Carson will have to say, I believe in Jesus Christ for myself. And so when they reach ninth grade, we provide training from October and through March and what it means to live your life for Christ. And we have retreats and classes, and they, they write their faith statements. And if they're ready to profess their faith publicly, then they confirm their faith. And that is what is going to be happening uh, this morning in just a few minutes. Now, not all of our parents bring their children for baptism as, as babies some of them prefer to wait until their children are old enough to make that decision for themselves. And so yesterday, three of our ninth graders were baptized by immersion at another church. And there's some pictures of how it went down yesterday. And so these confirmands, they're ready. 
They've been baptized, and they are now ready to take their vows of membership, to commit their, themselves to, to live in the Christ-like life, taking their place in the body of Christ. So let's begin. I'd like to invite uh, Matt Howe, our Director of Student Ministries, to join me up front. And make sure that, that William gets his later on. <laughs> All right, Confirmands, you've been quiet over there. All right, Taylor, you're up. This is Taylor Contino. All right, Taylor. The Holy Spirit work within you that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Here's your All right, and this is Justin Hot. Justin, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is Hannah McCauley. Hannah, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the other Hannah, Hannah Winner. Hannah, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I have a couple more questions for you. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen this ministry? If so say, I will. And as members of this congregation, Will you faithfully participate in this ministry by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Well, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give, give thanks, thanks for all that, that God has already given, given you. And we, we welcome you in Christian love. love as, as members, members together, together with you in the body of Christ. Christ and in, in this, this congregation, congregation of the United, United Methodist, Methodist Church, we, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate these young people, shall we?
see all of our confirmands have gone into the, the vestry. If you will, make sure that you greet them and welcome into the life of Anderson Hills before you leave. Now, that will really encourage and inspire them. And now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incredible love of God the Father, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.